I'm Jessica the Museum Guide and today we're talking about the most bizarre British Christmas traditions including the hood and horse here at the Hearn Bay Museum. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Today we're talking about a tradition near and dear to my heart. British folklore and unusual Christmas traditions. As many of you know, I am a Canadian transplant here on this isle, and as a true historian and anthropologist, I'm fascinated by the native customs of my adopted home. Now, for my non British and non Commonwealth viewers, there are certainly some traditions that are ho hum to me that you might think are unusual. Things like Christmas crackers, paper crowns, Boxing Day, and even going for a cold water swim on Christmas Day. But these are just slightly strange to an outsider. No, I want to dig into the truly bizarre, archaic, and weird traditions that are steeped in mad history <laughs> and the wicker man style folklore that this island is so known for. We're focusing on the folk traditions of mumming, guising, and wassailing, with a particular emphasis on hooded horses and other hobby horses, but a lot more. As always, I'm always so happy when my viewers support my channel, so if you like this video, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. You can also become a member of my channel for great bonus content. You can find that details below. You can also find details on how to leave me a tip for my tours. But I'm just happy to have you here no matter what. Also, to get you into the festive spirit, I have three other Christmas videos and those are all linked below. Keep in mind that I'm mostly focusing on traditions that have been revived, with the exception of a few interesting Tudor customs from the Museum of the Home. So if you'd like a video on strange Christmas traditions that are no longer practiced, let me know in the comments below. But now it's time to grab a glass of Christmas cheer, relax, and let's get started. We're starting our tour today with a tradition from East Kent, where I'm lucky enough to live after 10 years of London. As I mentioned, I'm at the Seaside Museum in Hearn Bay for their Hood and Horse exhibition, a uniquely East Kent take on the enigmatic Christmas hobby horses found all over the country. These wonderfully bizarre horses are carried by wassailers. Wassailers are kind of like naughty carolers who are up to cheeky seasonal no good. This custom shares a lot in common with mumming. I'll talk more about mummers shortly when I detail the customs associated with Tudor Christmas celebrations. But mummers tend to enact more elaborate plays with specific plots and storylines, while with sailors are more interested in cider, orchards, caroling, and less scripted mayhem. Wassail comes from the Norse, be in good health, and as you're parading through orchards with your best mates, it's pretty easy to feel your best. Some people believe that the custom emerged as a way to appease the spirits and ensure a good harvest the following season. Wassailers, which in East Kent can also be called howlers, which I love, are often accompanied by animal geysers. That is, people disguised in animal costumes, like these horses. While there is some debate over the etymology of hood and horse, with some believing it is connected to the one-eyed Norse god Woden, the most likely meaning is simply hooded. The puppeteer wears a hooded disguise. The hood and horse and its merry band of wassailers would go from house to house, flinging open the doors and causing gleeful chaos, with the horse's hobnail teeth or stone teeth clacking and gnashing, much to the delight of children and adults alike. Although some adults recall feeling sheer terror when they were small, as you would. Remember, Christmas and terror often go together. Watch my video on the Christmas witches and monsters of Europe. When one goes with sailing with a hood and horse, which I plan to do with the Sandwich Medieval Society on January 7th, there are typically five key roles. The hood and horseman under a sackcloth, a jockey who jokingly tries to ride the horse, a wagoner who cracks the whip and leads the procession, musicians and singers, and a molly a lad dressed up as a woman who swans around and sweeps up after the horse. I'm going to talk about something called molly dancers a little bit later on. Many mumming and wassailing traditions include some form of drag like this. Hmm, that doesn't seem too different from a panto dame, which I'm going to talk about briefly towards the end of this video. While I was here at the Hearn Bay Seaside Museum, I was lucky enough to meet James Frost, the curator of this exhibit, and he told me all about one of the horses when I admired its oyster decorations. Yeah, so that one um, was made in Whitstable in the 1950s by a school teacher 
Edward Coomba. But the reason it's got shells stuck to it, those weren't original, but it was kept in a shed near the seafront and the whole shed and everything got washed into the sea with a storm and they recovered the court, the horse oh, from wow. the sea and then pinned oyster shells to it as a memory of oh, that that's moment. beautiful. So it's a lovely, lovely story. It's got quite, it has had quite a history. It's looking quite battered now. It's been very, very well used. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Of course, I was also really delighted to see his favourite hooded horse in action. Do you know what his teeth are made of? Can you see? Can you guess? Careful. Am I what you think. Stone. That's right, yeah. It's pebbles from the beach. Yeah? yeah. Now, hooded horses are usually made from wood. In fact, I am on the waiting list for a workshop to make my very own hooded horse this month. But as you can see here, some hooded horses are made from real horses' skulls. This one was recently found in someone's attic after they attended the hooded horse exhibition at Maidstone Museum a few months ago. That makes the hooded horses of East Kent even more similar to the most famous hobby horses on this aisle. The iconic Mary Lloyd, hailing from South Wales. Like the hooded horse, the Mary Lloyd is a hobby horse topped with a horse's skull, bedecked with ribbons and sometimes with glass eyes, and paraded around by a wassailer hidden under a sackcloth. But while wassailing is a very old tradition, the Mary Lloyd is a more recent addition to this island's lore. The first written record of this Welsh custom dates to around 1800, although some folklorists believe that it has pre-Christian origins, despite a lack of medieval references, while others think it has pagan Norse origins. It's more likely to have emerged in the late 18th century, when hobby horses became fashionable with the social elite. Mary Lloyd was sailors traditionally include a leader, a man to carry the horse, and other people dressed as traditional characters, such as Punch and Judy. Once the wassailers arrive at your door, they sing and dance and ask for entry, and the residents are expected to deny them entry in a good-natured way, and the Mary Lloyd runs around, snapping its jaws at children and tapping on the doors and windows. The banter often continues for a few rounds, and then the residents relent and invite the chilly wassailers in for food, drink, and cheer. And despite the geographic distance, there is no doubt that the Mary Lloyd is related to the hooded horse of Kent, the poor old hoss of Yorkshire, and other hosses and hobby horses and hooded animals found around the country, as well as on the Isle of Man and Ireland. Amongst them, the broad or hooded bull of the Cotswolds, known to carry a wassail bowl decorated with ribbons and evergreen, an old tup of the Midlands, a hooded goat this time, or sometimes a sheep, who wassails accompanied by men dressed up as a butcher, Beelzebub, and one in drag. It's all getting very wicker man in here, don't you think? And I mean that in the best way possible, of course. Of course, many of us prefer our horses alive and kicking. So if that sounds more your speed, you should head to the Fox Inn at Bucks Green on Christmas Day, near Horsham in West Sussex. Just before Christmas lunch is served, a live horse walks through the pub, much to the adoring delight of the patrons. Now, no one knows exactly when and how this tradition started, but it might be done to preserve an ancient right of way. Remember, in the UK, we have a right to roam, which allows us to maintain ancient paths, even when they cross private property, as long as they are continuously in use. The horse follows a brick path through the pub to the back lawn, where he is treated to carrots and sometimes even a beer. I mean, it's Christmas after all. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the tour, we're mostly focusing on old customs that are still practiced today. But all of this horse talk reminded me of a strange Boxing Day, that is, a day after Christmas, tradition. You might be thinking about shopping on Boxing Day, but in the 16th century, people were sharpening their lancets to perform bloodletting on their horses and cattle. Of course, it was important to balance the four humors, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm and blood for humans, so why not for animals as well? Now, by the way, I'm planning a video about the history of surgery and bloodletting at the old operating theatre, so let me know in the comments if you're interested in watching that. Now, you might not realise that December 26 is also St. Stephen's Day. We'll talk about this day again shortly with the Wren boys of Ireland and Northern England. So why bleed livestock on his feast day? Well, he may have been thought of as the patron saint of horses, but there might be an even more practical reason. 
The day after Christmas was often a day of rest, and the slower pace around the holidays would give the animals a chance to recover from what we now know is their wholly unnecessary bloodletting. Now today, it's common to see hobby horses and animal geysers alongside Morris dancers like this delightful troop, the Bower Street Morris dancers from Margate. Morris dancers aren't strictly associated with Christmas, but when it comes to the revival of weird folk traditions, things all start to meld together in a wonderful way, and there's always Morris dancers at any kind of British folklore celebration. Here, the dancers are performing in Margate's tiniest pub, the Petit Prince, after dancing outside for the Christmas market. Now we're going to challenge each other. Like many of these traditions today, including the hooded horses, it's also common to see Morris dancers at May Day festivals and around the summer solstice. While they are traditionally men, Margate is known as Shoreditch on Sea, and it's quite progressive. Our Morris dancing troupe is open to ladies, gents, and folks beyond the binary. Now, some Morris troops, particularly in Yorkshire, perform specific long sword dances for Christmas time to encourage a fruitful harvest in the spring. At the end of the dance, the swords are woven into a star or triangle. Like so many enjoyable things and most Christmas traditions, sword dances were banned under Oliver Cromwell, but made a fierce comeback under Charles II. And while a lot of Morris dancing is performed by revivalist groups like the Bower Street Troupe, longsword dances are often still performed by their original villages who have been doing the same dances for hundreds of years. <laughs> Now we're going to head to the Museum of the Home, formerly known as the Jeffrey Museum. This is just a little excerpt from the video that I released last year. The Museum of the Home decorates each of its period rooms up in period appropriate Christmas decorations, and this is the 16th century room. Christmas was usually celebrated for the 12 days after Christmas Day at this time. You can see the pine boughs that were used to decorate this room, as well as the Yule log crackling away in the fireplace. During the 12 days of Christmas, people would play games of Skittles or cards, eating delicious feasts every night of the best food that they could afford, including this boar's head, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Let's talk a little bit about the pine boughs, which had been collected and hung in the winter in England for thousands of years. We have evidence of this from the times of the earliest settlements, far earlier than any Christian worship in the country. Evergreens were prized for their ability to stay fresh and green throughout the cold winter season, symbolizing rebirth and everlasting life. Of course, that meaning translates very easily into the Christian context. Holly, mistletoe, and ivy can all produce fruit even in the coldest parts of winter, giving them further symbolism of abundance for a new year ahead. Here is the fire log, a tradition brought to England from Scandinavia, where the Norse celebration of Yule marked the annual solstice when the days would begin to get longer again. A log decorated with ribbons and evergreen boughs would be lit with a stump of last year's log the Yule brand. Ideally, it should burn for the entire 12 days, and if it went out, that was a symbol of bad fortune. Traveling bands of actors called mummers would travel from door to door, enacting mummers plays. While this tradition is now rather uncommon in the UK, you can still see a mummers parade every New Year's Day in Philadelphia. Though banned in the 1860s after the murder of a local man by masked mummering men, mummering in Newfoundland and Labrador experienced a big resurgence in the 1980s. Now, there is an annual mummers festival in St. John's around Christmas time. My personal favourite mummers come from County Armagh in Northern Ireland. In this room here, gifts were typically exchanged on New Year's Day rather than Christmas, and that didn't change until the middle of the 19th century, which we'll see later on. It was very common for peasants to give their landlords a gift of the best produce, like a plump capon, a castrated male cock, fattened for eating, or baskets of apples and eggs. These gifts weren't exactly mandatory, but they weren't not mandatory, if you know what I mean. With the wealth and a decadence of this room, we are clearly in the landlord's home, so we should be receiving our decadent gifts soon. The head of the household would enter a room like this with the pièce de résistance of the feast, a boar's head on a platter, or even a cock and thrice, this nightmare, 
which is the hind of a chicken stitched to a pig's head. And yes, people did actually eat this. In poorer households, it would be a piece of brawn, a boiled down piece of lesser cut, later to refer exclusively to a pig's brain tureen. The first turkeys do arrive to the UK in the 1530s, but they do not become popular at Christmas until the late 1600s, and they don't become the roast of choice until the 19th century, when so many other modern Christmas traditions take hold. However, in this room, the crowning glory of the sweets would be a march pane, a highly decorated disc of marzipan decorated with other brightly colored sweets. People would also make little gag sweets, like bacon and eggs made from marzipan, accompanied by jellies, tarts, fruit pies, and biscuits, all in elaborate stands. It was a very idealized and classic Christmas. Well, I think that all of the traditions on this tour are photogenic and enigmatic. For me, the strangest by far are the Ren boys, sometimes pronounced Ran, but with my accent, who knows? I mean, just look at this haunting image. The tradition of Wren Day, or the Day of the Wren, which makes it sound even more ominous, takes place on St. Stephen's Day, which is, remember, also Boxing Day, December 26th. While the Day of the Wren primarily occurs on the Isle of Man, and in Ireland, both the Republic and, nor- and in the North, Wren boys were traditionally also found in England as well, and the tradition has been revived in Suffolk and in the village of Middleton, where it's been performed since 1994, when it was revived by the Old Glory Molly Dancers. By the way, Middleton is in Suffolk, and it's home to a very particular East Anglian form of Morris dancing called Molly dancing, in which the Molly, a term for an effeminate man or the man in drag that often accompanies mummers and geysers, performs a duet with one of the male dancers. But back to the Wren boys. Similar festivals also occur in Spain and France. On the day of the Wren, crowds of straw boys, a specific type of mummer, young boys that dress in straw suits, masks, and colorful clothing, hunt a Wren and place it atop a decorated pole or pitchfork covered with ribbons and holly. While today it's usually a fake Wren, it was a real Wren in the past. As with other mumming traditions, of which we've covered many, the straw boys then go door to door causing mischief and collecting money for charity, playing tricks on their friends, and just generally engaging in tomfoolery. They're often led by a Wren captain in a cape and with a sword, and they meet and kind of fight other factions. Some of the boys dress up as old women. There's drag again. In some cases, the Wren boys give a feather from the Wren, real or fake, to a patron or even a girl they fancy. Much like the Morris dancers, some revivalist troops include girls and adults instead of just young boys. The origins of the Wren hunt are unclear. Some believe it descended from Norse tradition or from Celtic mythology and Druidic rituals, with the Wren a symbol of the past year and winter song. In the Isle of Man, the festival is associated with the queen of the fairies named Tehi Tegi, who enchants men and drowns them, and she can turn into a Wren. The most common theory in Ireland is that God set out a contest to determine the king of all birds, and a tricky Wren hitched a ride on an eagle's wing and won. The Straw Boys really remind me of the ancient Skeckling tradition on the Shetland Islands, which takes place around Halloween. Remember, with these customs, there's often a lot of crossover between May Day, Solstice, Halloween, and of course, Christmas. Now, in the last section, I spoke about the Yule Log. But that isn't the only wood-burning tradition in England. If you head to Devon and Somerset, you'll be treated to the warm glow of the Ashen Faggot. Yep, that's the original meaning of the word, of course, a bundle of wooden sticks. And like so many other customs on this tour, it is related to... wassailing. Traditionally, during the merriment on Christmas Eve, a bundle of ash sticks was bound with nine strips, called withies, of young green ash wood stripped from the same tree. And the bundle must contain one of the remnants of the last year's faggot. At a pivotal moment during the celebrations, the oldest person in the room places the faggot in the hearth and revelers sing Dunster carols, the joyous carols from the small village of Dunster in Somerset. As each binding snaps in the fire, everyone in the room cheers and takes a drink. In some villages, the young women each choose a withy, and the one who's chosen the first withy to snap is said to be the next to marry. And some people also lay bets on which withy will snap first. I swear people will gamble on anything. At the end of the night, anyone planning to host their own festivities the following year takes a burnt withy stump, and they will include this in their own ashen faggot. 
Today, the pubs along the Devon Somerset border that still celebrate this custom do so on January 6th, which is Old or Orthodox Christmas Eve. If you want to take part in this ancient custom, head to the Harbour Inn in Axmouth. They build an ashen faggot six feet high and three feet wide and set it alight in their massive fireplace. Now we're heading all the way down south, very far south, to Penzance in Cornwall. While the Montal Festival includes many ancient elements, it's actually only been celebrated since 2007. It's held on the feast day of St. Thomas the Apostle, usually December 21st each year, and revives many traditional Cornish customs. The date, which is winter solstice, is no coincidence. These are pre-Christian pagan traditions. The name Montal comes from the vocabulary of the Cornish language, which was already dying out by this time, compiled by Edward Lewid in the year 1700. He translated it as winter solstice and later as balance. Montal is primarily a guising festival. Now remember, guising, which takes place across the UK and Ireland at Halloween and also at Christmas, is related to wassailing and mumming. During Montal, geysers dress up, sing and dance and take part in elaborate parades. You can see them here wearing masks and other costumes and carrying lanterns during their processions. And we'll see some more lanterns in Brighton shortly. In a callback to pre-Tudor traditions, a Lord of Misrule is selected from the revelers. Traditionally, this festival fooled leads the celebrations, encouraging drunkenness and tomfoolery, and at Montal, he is the star of the show. He leads the procession, followed by Pen Hood, who's the Montal hobby horse, there's hobby horses again, and Pen Glass, who is the Golowan hobby horse. Now, Golowan is the summer solstice equivalent of Montal, so there, now you have two reasons to visit Penzance, or three if you count pirates. People take part in a traditional Cornish candle dance around a basket of colourful lit candles, and the geysers perform skits about St. George and the Turkish knight, or the Bucca, a massive Cornish sea spirit that some scholars believe may have been a pre-Christian deity in the area. It's all very Lovecraftian. Hail Dagon. Remember, this is all ostensibly about Christmas. Um, okay, I love the pagan connections. As the evening wears on, it's time for the chalking of the mock. That's the traditional Cornish Yule log, decorated with a stick figure in a very Blair Witch sort of fashion, and then set alight on a massive Montal bonfire. Everyone gathers around, engages in some mischief, has a tipple, or five, and has a great night. The festival was paused for COVID, but it's back in full swing. I'd personally love to go. I can't leave Cornwall without talking about another bizarre Cornish tradition, Tom Bocock's Eve, an annual festival held on the 23rd of December in Mausel, a beautiful fishing village. It's also spelled Mousehole, but it's never pronounced that way. The festival honours a mythical Mausel res resident, Tom Bocock, who attempted to feed the village during a famine by fishing in a severe storm. Now, the word Bocock was a medieval slang for a good dude, essentially with potential origins with the French Bocock, or handsome rooster, with the rooster a pagan symbol of light and hope. To commemorate Tom Bocock's successes at sea, the striving villagers were said to have made a giant pie with seven types of fish, poking the heads out of the top as if they were gazing at the stars and the heavens above. Today, the people in Mausel eat stargazy pie, a fish, egg, and potato pie complete with protruding pilchard heads that are gazing up at the stars and take part in a lantern procession. And we have another lantern procession coming up soon. Tell me in the comments below if you're brave enough to have some stargazy pie. <laughs> It kind of reminds me of the Italian-American tradition of the Feast of the Seven Fishes. Now, speaking of fish, there's another similar old tradition in Folkestone near Christmas time, when eight whiting, a type of white fish, were offered in a feast to celebrate St. Rumbold, an infant saint from Buckingham who lived for three days in 662 and was said to be able to speak from the moment of birth. I mean, sure. <laughs> He is, for some reason that no one really seems to know, the patron saint of fishermen in Folkestone, which is nowhere near Buckinghamshire, and there's even stained glass windows in the local church decorated with St. Rumble's whiting. And staying on the coast, how about a purely modern tradition? Ever since 1993, folks in Brighton, a very hippie town, have been burning clocks as a response to the commercialization of Christmas. Revelers parade through the streets carrying lanterns made from withies, 
papers and paper, all dressed in costumes that include a clock face to mark the passing of time. Every year has a slightly different theme, and the festival even has its own craft beer, of course. (laughs) Held on the 21st of December every year, everyone ends up at the seafront and they burn the lanterns in a massive bonfire. The Same Sky Arts Initiative, who founded the festival, say that this is all about, quote, creating new urban rituals to replace those traditional festivals that were lost in the dash to be new and non-superstitious. Now, we've been talking about ancient traditions and revived folk customs associated with harvest, villages, and farming culture, but there is one strange British custom that's still very much still beloved in cities and towns across the country, and I'm talking about the pantomime dame. Now, when I first moved to the UK, my now husband offered to take my mom and me to a pantomime, and I assumed he meant a mime show, and I kind of didn't want to go. No offense to the mimes in my audience. But I soon realized that a pantomime is a British Christmas play that emerges out of the Italian travesti theatrical tradition popular in the 17th and 18th century. In these plays, which feature a lot of audience participation and body jokes designed to go over children's heads, the most beloved character is the dame. The dame is played by a man in a super camp way. Last year, none other than Sir Ian McKellen played Mother Goose in the West End. The most famous dame characters include Mother Goose, Widow Twanky, Aladdin's mother, the nanny or the nurse in Babes in the Woods, the cook in Dick Whittington, the queen in Puss in Boots, and Goldilocks' mother. Remember, the hoodening custom and many mummers plays and the Wren boys include drag characters as well, so there's a connection here to the ancient entertainment enjoyed on these aisles. Now we've come to the end of our tour of these different strange Christmas traditions. And let me know in the comments below if I've missed any for a potential part two next year. I'll see you the next time I'm at the museum. Merry Christmas.